The Baptism of the Holy Spirit, Part 2, for Radical Disciples During These Very, Very Last Days. If you'd like to have the playlist of videos for all of these sessions for Radical Disciples, or you'd like to have the accompanying PowerPoint presentations, please feel free to email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Elijah003, I would be more than delighted to give you the playlist of videos and also the PowerPoint presentations. Mark chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. I believe some of us are also amazed at those words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and they said to each other, so who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and then the age to come, eternal life. My wife, Lucille, and I, we can testify that for us, the Lord's promise has been and is being fulfilled. It truly is. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, part two. Luke 3, verse 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was being baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Before the Spirit descended on Jesus, Jesus was already pleasing his Father. The Father was well pleased with his Son's obedience. Receiving the Holy Spirit, as Jesus did, is contingent on obedience to the Lord's commands. There is a condition. There are conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit. One of them is obedience to the Lord's commands. Later, Jesus said to his disciples, John 14, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth. Notice what Jesus says here. If you love me, you will keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate, the spirit of truth, meaning the Holy Spirit. We also must keep the Lord's commands in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Keep my commands. Luke 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. Only after that. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread. 
Only after his fast did Jesus manifest the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. Only after fasting. Only after the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus during his baptism at the Jordan River, and only after his fast did Jesus return in the power of the Spirit to perform miracles. In the same way, in order for the Holy Spirit to descend on us as he did on, on our Lord Jesus, it is important for us to please our Father in heaven through our obedience. And as we will see in a moment, the early disciples were obediently praying and fasting for days before the Holy Spirit descended. The disciples were totally committed to their Lord Jesus after having spent three years following him, listening to him, and witnessing the absolutely unbelievable miracles he performed, not only healing the sick and casting out demons, but walking on water, multiplying the bread and the fish, and other such unbelievable miracles. With their own eyes, they witnessed his bodily ascension up to heaven. They were therefore totally committed to their Lord. In the same way, in order for the Holy Spirit to descend on us as he did on the early disciples, it is important for us to please our Father in heaven by obedience and keeping his commands. Again, John 14, verse 15, Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, that is the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, gathering them together. Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. They were intent on being baptized in the Holy Spirit as they sought the Lord in the upper room. They were intent. Why? Because they wanted to receive power to be witnesses for their Lord. With one mind, they were devoting themselves to prayer during the days before Pentecost. This is obedience which pleases the Lord. That is a condition for receiving the Holy Spirit, as did the early disciples. Compare that to how we typically receive the Holy Spirit today in some of our meetings. First, we listen to an hour long teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then after that, someone will come and pray over us. And that is typically followed by hands laid upon us for us to receive the Holy Spirit. And then we are expected to speak in unknown tongues. If we do not, then someone might come to us and coach us to speak in tongues. 
the person will speak in tongues, and then we are told to repeat after them to utter the same sounds. I call that coaching to speak in tongues. We do not find that in the Bible. But this is what is often done in certain meetings where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is being taught. The early disciples, however, intent on receiving the Spirit, were in prayer and preparation for days before receiving the Holy Spirit not just in one service necessarily, but they were in prayer and preparation for days. In doing so, they pleased the Lord. In the same way, disciples today may need preparation in their hearts before receiving the Holy Spirit. We ought to be pleasing the Lord. Let's talk about speaking in tongues here. Speaking in unknown tongues. Acts 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, notice that these early disciples did not need to be coached to speak in tongues, as is done today in some meetings. No, the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in unknown tongues. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So therefore, this diverse crowd spoke various tongues. You see, there were Jews from every nation in the Middle East, and they spoke their own languages from their home countries. All right. So this crowd of Jews, they spoke various languages. When they heard this sound... A crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. You see, they had their own languages being from different countries in the Middle East. But each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking in tongues Galileans? Local Jews? The crowd of Jews coming from different nations was bewildered by the tongues spoken by the local Galilean Jews. Tongues which they recognized as the languages of the various nations from which they had come. You see, they had gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And they heard these local Jews, Galilean Jews, speaking in the tongues which they recognized as the languages of the countries from which they had come. So they were amazed. How is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, that's where they came from. Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. We came from Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, near Cyrene. Some of us are visitors from Rome. At Pentecost, there was miraculous understanding of earthly languages, languages which were unknown to the Galileans speaking the languages. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, in the languages of the people of the countries from which we came. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? The tongues were supernaturally understood by the listeners to be declaring the wonders of God. Let's look at other instances of speaking in tongues in the book of Acts. 
Peter preaching at the home of Cornelius. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So the tongues spoken that day by the Gentiles were also understood by the Jewish believers as what? As praising God. The tongues were understood as praising God. They were understood in some local language as praising God. Paul at Ephesus with John's disciples. And keep in mind, those were Gentiles. They did not speak Hebrew, all right? Let's look at Paul at Ephesus with John's disciples. Acts 19, Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And so he told John's disciples to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. That's what John was telling the people. Believe on the one who comes after me, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized, meaning John's disciples were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right. So these were disciples of John the Baptist. I believe serious, committed disciples of John the Baptist. And here... Paul baptized them. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. The tongues spoken that day by the disciples of John the Baptist were also supernaturally understood by the listeners to be prophecies. And then, but the tongues spoken today at meetings as so-called evidence of the baptism are never understood. Therefore, there is a problem with this teaching, especially when coaching is required before the believer speaks in tongues. So my problem is that the only evidence of the baptism is people speaking in tongues. The problem is, when they do speak in tongues, we never understand what they're saying. And sometimes we have to coach them before they can speak in tongues. So we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, not simply to speak in tongues. Although if you do, praise God. But it is not simply to speak in tongues. It is not simply for us to enjoy our lives on earth more. It is not just to receive more of God's blessings in this life. It is not only to feel the Lord's presence and love, but rather to be his bold witnesses in our Jerusalem, in our Judea, in our Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. What is the real evidence for being baptized in the Holy Spirit? I'm going to share with you my position on this. What is the real evidence? It should not simply be speaking in tongues, but rather bearing good fruit as bold witnesses of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as growing in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is, growing in love, in joy, in peace, in patience, in goodness, in kindness, in faithfulness, in gentleness, and in self-control. It is very important for us to grow in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. To me, if you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, that is the evidence that you are born again. Holy character. Let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Continued. A refilling with the Holy Spirit is possible even after Pentecost, even after you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you can be refilled with the Holy Spirit. Let's see how this took place in the book of Acts. Acts 4, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit again, and they spoke the word of God boldly. All right. That is the primary purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit, to speak the word of God boldly. 
just before Stephen was martyred. Acts 7, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, our spiritual eyes can be opened to see the invisible realm of the kingdom of God. Paul performing an eye-opening miracle with authority when filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 13, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Ah, this is a wonderful opportunity for spreading the gospel. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Now, the proconsul was the head man of this island. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Now, this teaching consisted not only of words, no, but of a powerful eye-opening miracle done by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Paul actually cursed this sorcerer. The curse came to pass. He went blind. Now, after this, it is likely that a wide door for the gospel was opened through the now believing Proconsul. Again, it has to do with proclaiming the kingdom of God. It has to do with spreading the gospel of the kingdom of God. That is the primary purpose of the infilling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not just speaking in tongues, not just prophesying. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Acts 13. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. After my wife and I were baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1977, we were filled with a supernatural joy we had never before experienced in our lives, even though we were already Christians. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Prophesying by the Holy Spirit. Yes. One function of the Holy Spirit is to prophesy through us. That is correct. But again, the primary purpose is not just speaking in tongues or prophesying, but proclaiming the kingdom of God with boldness and effectiveness. Acts 21. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Boldness for the Great Commission. The primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mark 16. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go and make disciples of all nations. It takes boldness to do this. And that boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. After Peter and John were persecuted after the lame beggar at the temple gate was healed in Acts chapter 3. After they, meaning the disciples, prayed. The place where they were meeting was shaken. 
and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Again and again and again. This is the primary purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit, to speak the word of God boldly, especially to those who never heard. So there can be more than one infilling of the spirit, bringing boldness to speak the word of God whenever needed. Here's a special note on Philip's evangelistic meetings in Samaria after he was baptized in the spirit at Pentecost. Acts 8, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. So Philip was performing signs by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was healing the sick and casting out demons. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man, this sorcerer, is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. So this sorcerer, Simon, could do impressive miracles with his witchcraft. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Simon's miracles were totally outdone by the miracles the Lord did through Philip. That's why even the sorcerer was astonished. Through Philip, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord did far greater works than Simon could do with sorcery and witchcraft. We are seeing this very same thing over and over and over through our trained harvest workers in India. So often we hear reports of someone who is sick or demonized and the family calls doctors, calls sorcerers, witch doctors to come and help. Nothing works. No prescription medication, no trance, no animal sacrifices, no mantras, no witchcraft, nothing helps. So finally, as a last resort, they call our Elijah Challenge workers who have been trained. They come, they minister in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. And that sick family member is now healed and delivered and for free. On our past mission trips to Africa, We've been to 12 countries in Africa on mission trips. And Africa is the birthplace of black magic, the birthplace of voodoo. We would boldly challenge witch doctors in public meetings. Typically, this is what we would do. We would go into a certain country in Africa. We would gather together local disciples. And then we would train them with the Elijah challenge. We would train them how to heal the sick and cast out demons in the name of Jesus. And after that, we would hold an open air meeting and we would invite unbelievers to come, to come and to be healed. We would invite the blind to come, the sick, the lame, the deaf to come and be healed. And of course, witch doctors would show up. Why? Because witch doctors, of course, would consider us to be their rivals, their competitors, because the realm in which we minister is similar. It's the realm of the miraculous. So typically, witch doctors will show up in our public meetings. And so during these public meetings, I would first preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then after that, before challenging people to repent and follow Jesus, I would address the witch doctors. I would say, I believe we have witch doctors present in the crowd today. I would like to know how much power you have. So I invite you to come forward 
and to use your witchcraft to heal the many sick people who have come to be healed in this meeting today. Come, come, come. Show me how much power you have. That's boldness. Where does that boldness come from? The Holy Spirit. And so after the challenge, I wait. I look at my watch. I wait for maybe a minute or two, and no one comes forward. And then I will say to the crowd, in that case, we will call on the name of our God. And we will ask our God to send the fire of healing that you may know that our God is the only true God and that Yeshua, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the only way to the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. And then after that, I pray. And after the prayer, in Jesus' name, I invite the newly trained disciples whom I have just trained to come forward, stand in a line facing the crowd. And I tell them, now I want you to heal the sick and cast out demons exactly as I just trained you to do the past few days. And then I invite those who need healing to come forward, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, they come forward. And the newly trained believers lay hands on them and exercise authority over the demon or the disease. And within seconds, people are healed, miraculously healed, set free from demons. And they come streaming up to the stage, to the platform. And I have them testify one by one by one by one by one by one. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. And after the testimonies, then I address the crowd. Now you have seen the evidence that our God is the one true God far greater than witchcraft, who wants to repent of their sins and follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And at that point, people stand up from everywhere in the crowd and come streaming to the front to repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ. Where does that boldness come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. The primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to give us boldness to proclaim the kingdom of God effectively and fruitfully. Now, let's go back to Philip in Samaria, Acts chapter 5. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been water baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The newly baptized believers had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Therefore, believers are not necessarily automatically baptized in the Holy Spirit when they are baptized in water. Not necessarily. Baptism in the Holy Spirit can be separate from water baptism. That was the case for me and for many others as well. Acts 5, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, Evangelist Philip did not have the ability of laying hands on believers for them to receive the Holy Spirit. He did not. That's why Peter and John had to come. Apostles Peter and John, they did have this ability to lay hands on believers for them to receive the Holy Spirit. So not everyone can do this. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is very interesting. Let me tell you why. Simon was a sorcerer who made his living performing miracles using witchcraft. And the miracles were impressive. But now he sees an opportunity to make lots of money. So why didn't Simon offer money instead to Philip and ask Philip, Philip, give me the amazing healing power that you have. 
why didn't he offer money to Philip to buy that healing power that Philip had? Why not? Well, because of the following. Simon was a good businessman. He knew that the Holy Spirit was the source of the healing power. Having the ability to impart the source of the power would be far more profitable than having just the healing power itself. So we can see how important it is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit for preaching the gospel and fulfilling the Great Commission. How did Peter respond to Simon's offer of money? Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. I'm not sure every servant of God today would respond the way Peter did if they were offered money, a big offering in return for the impartation of some gift. Who knows? Let's look at Paul now. Acts 9, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we see Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the hands of Ananias, a little known believer. He was not an apostle like Peter or John. But nevertheless, God used Ananias to lay hands on Paul for Paul to receive the Holy Spirit. And who was Paul? Paul was perhaps the greatest apostle, the greatest missionary who ever lived. How was he baptized in the Holy Spirit? Through whom? Through Ananias, a little known believer. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again, he got up and was baptized. There are different ways to receive the Holy Spirit, different ways that we see in the book of Acts. Through prayer and the laying on of hands, as, as we see in Acts 8 through Peter and John, and Acts 19 through the Apostle Paul. Also, by hearing the word of God. When Peter was at the home of Cornelius, as he was sharing the word of God, the Holy Spirit came upon those Gentiles. All right. By prayer, according to Luke 11, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking. Let me share with you the context of Luke chapter 11 here. Okay. Jesus said, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Lord gives the Holy Spirit to disciples who reveal their commitment by their persistent asking and seeking and knocking. Now, one thing about the Apostle Paul, right? Yes, he went around persecuting the church. But let me tell you, his heart was pure, all right? He did not do it for self-glory. He was devoted to Judaism. And so his motivation was pure, all right? The Lord knew that. And so the Lord sent Ananias to minister to him the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul he was a very, uh, a very faithful, yes, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Very faithful to the law. Now, two kinds of tongues, two kinds of tongues. Well, 1 Corinthians 14, okay? Recall that 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all right? Now, let's read verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to 
God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Okay, according to Paul, people who are speaking with the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, anyone who speaks in the gift of tongues is speaking to God and no one understands them. All right. So note that the tongues mentioned here as one of the nine gifts of the spirit are not understood by anyone. Therefore, the private tongues listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 as one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which no one understands, are different from the tongues spoken at Pentecost when believers receive the Holy Spirit. You recall that at Pentecost, the tongues spoken were understood by the Jews who were present. Okay, so the tongues which are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, those are private tongues. Those are directed at God and no one understands them. And those tongues are different from the tongues spoken on the day of Pentecost. The tongues spoken at Pentecost were understood by the Jews who were present. Here are different terms signifying the same thing. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit coming upon believers. The Spirit was given. Baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Different terms signifying the same thing. The gift of the Holy Spirit poured out. They signified the same thing, all of them. Now, what about the gifts of the Holy Spirit now? We have been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, power and boldness to proclaim the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. What about now the gifts as opposed to the power? 1 Corinthians 12, 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Verse 7, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. That is the common good of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, so it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. So it is clear that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for ministering to believers in the context of building up the body of Christ. The supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit are primarily for building up believers in the church. But the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to give us power and boldness to witness and to proclaim the kingdom of God to outsiders for our Lord Jesus. You see how they differ. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So you see, there's a difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference. To me, the primary purpose is for proclaiming the kingdom of God with boldness and effectiveness and fruitfulness. Yes, of course, we will speak in tongues. We will prophesy. But to me, especially during these very last days before the end comes, we must focus on the boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit to fulfill the Great Commission, to make disciples of all nations, to heal the sick, cast out demons bring multitudes to Jesus Christ, reach the several thousand totally unreached people groups which still exist on the face of the earth. Only after they are reached, then the end will come. To me, the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for that purpose, to fulfill the Great Commission. Only then the end will come. We must proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to every tribe, every nation, every language, every group, only then the end will come. 
And we can do that only after we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let me share with you something that we did in Las Vegas back in the year 2016, boldly witnessing for Jesus. All right. I was in Las Vegas for that weekend on Friday evening. We, taught, we began the Elijah Challenge training. There was a group of disciples from different parts of the United States. Then we continued all day Saturday. And then on Sunday morning, I said, I don't want you to go to church this morning. I want you to go out to the Las Vegas Strip. I want you to break up into four teams. Each team must make a big sign that says free miraculous healing. Okay, there you can see Brother Teddy and his dear wife, Saranda. Okay, Brother Teddy was with us. In fact, I believe he hosted this event in Las Vegas. Right, Teddy? Right. Okay, if you want to read the whole report, just click on that link that you see to the left of the photo. There was a sister who came from Wisconsin all the way to Las Vegas for this training. Her name was Jan. And this is the report that she gave after that weekend. I totally agree. The hour on the street, that is the Vegas Strip, was like being caught up in Elijah's whirlwind. For me, it was an easy way to minister to people on the street for several reasons. First, I was in a small group of five people, so I was not alone. Our group was of mixed ages and ethnicity. It seemed ideal as we ministered to Asians, to Blacks, to Hispanics, and white folks. The diversity of our group seemed to put people we met on the street at ease. We boldly walked the street, smiling and making eye contact while one in the group carried a sign saying, free miraculous healing. As people read it, they understood when we asked if they needed healing in any part of their body. Some said no, but many said yes. Brother Teddy, you should take an opportunity to share what you and Saranda witnessed as you went out with that sign in your hands. After the Friday and Saturday training, each person in our group was willing to take the challenge and minister healing in the name of Jesus on the Vegas Strip. I believe the experience exceeded the expectations of our group. Usually one person would speak first and the others in our group would agree. Sometimes the leader would drop back and another would take a turn leading the healing ministry. After they were miraculously healed, it was a natural transition to ask people if they knew Jesus as savior. After they were healed, one young man answered he did not know for sure, so I asked if he would like to pray the prayer of salvation. He said yes, so I was able to pray with this young man who was a street dancer, part-time stripper, to receive Jesus Christ. And there you see him, surrounded by the ladies, that young man not wearing a shirt. You see, he was a stripper and a stripper in a nightclub and he was a street performer and at that moment he was outside on the street performing trying to get donations of course and when he saw the sign he was interested why because because of his actions as a street performer he had some muscle strains in his leg and i believe in his forearm in his wrist and so he asked for miraculous healing so these ladies laid hands on him in jesus name and issued commands, and he was healed. The pain disappeared. And after that, they shared the gospel with him, and he wanted to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Come just as you are. Come just as you are, even without a shirt. After the Elijah Challenge training in Las Vegas, I realized how easy it is just to ask people if they have any illness and if they would like ministry for healing. This was easier than door-to-door -door evangelism. So many people have pain and many will take the offer to receive ministry if we just ask them. We did not concern ourselves with those who rejected us. People rejected Jesus all the time, especially the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. We just moved on to the next people coming our way. 
I would do this again, and I would recommend this training to every believer. And of course, now we are doing the Elijah Challenge on Mondays. Thank you, founders of the Elijah Challenge, for surrendering yourselves to God and offering this training. Now, if you would like to know more about this training, send me an email, and I'll let you know, all right? If you haven't been trained, that is. My email is Elijah003 at gmail.com. It was so good to meet all of you taking the challenge. We are bolder than before. We have no fear in the Lord. So let us ask, seek, and knock. And keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. For what? For who? For the Holy Spirit, of course. You can be filled with the Spirit more than once. At our next class, radical grace to bear lasting fruit like the Apostle Paul. Please join us next week, a week from today. Now, I'm going to continue sharing about our missionary adventures in West Borneo, 1978 to 1987. If you missed our earlier sharing or you would like to have our book, Dancing on the Edge, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. All right. Just give me a moment here while I get ready. Okay. This is Brother Abak and his wife, Abat Saul. Uh, Abak was a local businessman when we first met him. He owned a small ice factory. Before they came to know the Lord, they were going through some difficult times. But after they came to know the Lord, they were set free, they were delivered, and they were blessed. After we left in 1987, after we were expelled by the Indonesian government, that is, it was Brother Abak who took over as pastor of the flock. Let me share with you his testimony. On a Saturday morning, Abak sat down in his dark, dimly lit kitchen with his Indonesian Bible. Opening it, he began to read the scriptures. After a while, he put the Bible down and he closed his eyes. Suddenly, he heard an audible voice. Abak, tomorrow at five o'clock in the afternoon, you will see the power of God. Abak opened his eyes the audible voice had been clear and distinct. He looked around, but saw no one. Who had spoken? He began to realize that no man had spoken to him, but that the voice had been of supernatural origin. Had God spoken to him, or an angel, or some other spiritual being? He wasn't sure, but he decided to step out in faith in his God. Abak came up to me the next day, a few minutes before our Sunday morning service. He went on to relate what he had experienced the previous morning. I listened with interest. And then he said to me, Pastor, please testify at the end of the service on my behalf. I replied quickly, and you want me to testify to the brethren as to what you heard? Are you sure? <clears throat> Now, as enthusiastic as I was about what Abak had experienced, I nevertheless knew that just on the basis of an audible supernatural voice, we would not be able to conclude that the voice was actually from God. <clears throat> Excuse me. The content of the message itself did not openly contradict scripture, but would it not be safer to wait until five o'clock that afternoon to see what would actually happen? If something actually took place, then we could give a testimony. What would happen if nothing took place? But with quiet assurance, Brother Abak told me, yes, Pastor, please share it with the brethren at the end of the service today. I admired his boldness, and at that moment, I felt a release in my heart to grant him his request. <clears throat> at the end of the morning meeting, I announced, Brethren, yesterday morning, our brother Abak heard a voice that he believes was the voice of the Lord. 
the voice told him that at five o'clock this afternoon, he will see the power of God. After that, I dismissed the service. In the middle of the afternoon later that day, Abak and some others decided to go visit with a family. Shortly before five o'clock, Abak and two other brothers assembled and together they set out for their destination. He had forgotten about his five o'clock appointment with God. Now, the family they visited received them warmly and invited them to come in. While Abak was sharing about the Lord Jesus, he suddenly saw an intense light that flooded the room, causing everything else to fade from sight. Overwhelmed by the light, Abak let out a loud scream in front of his stunned listeners and fell to his knees and worshiped to his God. The others did not see the light, but they quickly fell to their knees as well and began to pray. That afternoon, Abak, like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus in the book of Acts, was appointed a servant of the Most High God. He gladly accepted the glorious call to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ to those living in darkness. As Abak knelt on the floor praying, one of his companions in the room saw beings that looked like angels in the room. His name was Karel. Karel was formerly a very powerful sorcerer in Indonesia. One of his former clients was the president of Indonesia at that time. There you see Karel at the right leading worship with a guitar. Karel was from Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. Earlier in his life, he found great interest in sorcery, and he finally achieved the status of a master sorcerer who could claim the then president of Indonesia as one of his clients. Since Karel, through his magic arts, could influence the course of local weather patterns, the president would consult with him concerning his travel plans, which involved flying. With 999 demon spirits at his fingertips, Karel was able to perform very unusual supernatural feats, and he became the ringleader of a group of thugs. Once he was arrested by the police in connection with a crime. At the police station, Karel was led into a room where he was tied down, arms and legs, to a table. Shortly, a large, powerfully built police officer came in. In his hands was a truncheon, a thick wooden stick. With mouth-watering anticipation, he leered at Karel, laid out helplessly before the table, before him on the table. The officer raised his truncheon high into the air and swung it down onto Karel's body with full force. Aye! The officer yelped dropping his truncheon and doubling over in great pain and surprise. Karel lay peaceful, peacefully on the table. Karel had perfected the use of a magic art which prevented physical pain or injury to the body. Karel's skill took it a step further, returning the blow back to the adversary, a form of voodoo doll magic. Not to be intimidated in front of his colleagues, the policeman retrieved his truncheon and swung again at Karel. Again, the policeman found that he was inflicting pain not on Karel, but on himself. After a few more tries, the poor policeman gave up, leaving the room in shame and in pain. So Karel was untied from the table and taken to a windowless cell in the police station. Not long afterwards, he was again free on the streets of Jakarta. But it was not because the police had decided to release him. No, they did not even know that he was no longer in the cell. In fact, the door had not even been opened. Karel had just vanished from his cell using his sorcery. Like Pharaoh's magicians, modern day sorcerers can also imitate God's miracles but only up to a point. 
At times, Karel was able to purchase items using not money, but tree leaves. The merchant or the store owner would see the leaves Karel handed to him, not as what they actually were, but as Indonesian currency. <laughs> After Karel left, the leaves would appear once again as leaves. Karel had intimate fellowship with the spirits whom you used and who used him in return. Often they would suddenly materialize before him in the form of a human being. Appearing as either male or female, they conversed with him just as people would talk to one another. One particular spirit who bore the name of a deceased woman who had lived a notorious life of sin often came to Karel as a very beautiful woman. She, quote unquote, loved Karel and wanted Karel to marry her. But Karel wisely resisted her advances. He knew the possible consequences of such a relationship. He knew that she could just as easily appear to him in the form of a snake as in the form of an alluring woman. Other men had not been so wise. Karel reported to us that after a certain man cohabitated with a spirit, the woman conceived and became pregnant, giving birth to offspring. These offspring, of course, did not possess flesh and blood, but could appear in the form of human beings. Now, such happenings may not be as far-fetched as they may first appear to be. In the Bible, Genesis 6, we see the Nephilim, and the Nephilim, as mentioned, might be describing such beings. After living a life of utter depravity, including severely injuring people who tried to share the gospel with him, Karel hated the name of Jesus Christ. Karel resolved to commit suicide. He could no longer bear the constant turmoil seething in his heart. But Karel was saved when Jesus appeared to him during his suicide attempt, calling him to repent and to go out preaching the good news instead. And so in the spring of 1982, Karel visited us in Batu Ampar. He shared with us about his former way of life and described how merciful God had been to him. We spent time fellowshipping with him and listening about the unbelievable ways of sorcery in Indonesia. One day, Karel walked about 10 miles into the interior of our town, Batu Ampar, to a village where we had never preached the gospel. So Karel he went and visited a chief sorcerer in a village in the interior. Having been, a, having been an accomplished sorcerer himself, Karel felt burdened for those who still practiced the dark arts, and so often he sought them out. Karel introduced himself to this man, beginning with his own past and personal testimony. He recounted the supernatural power the success and the influence he had gained in the capital city of Jakarta. The village sorcerer was clearly impressed by Karel's accomplishments as a sorcerer, but Karel told him of the despair which gnawed away at his soul and how Jesus Christ had snatched him away from death and destruction and suicide, giving him instead joy, peace, and eternal life. The sorcerer asked him, but, but what about the spirits you used to serve? You've betrayed them. You've switched allegiance to Jesus Christ. Aren't you afraid that they're going to get you sooner or later? Now, having heard this question many times already, Karel was ready with the answer. Karel said, the demons are indeed very displeased with me. They would indeed like to kill me. But God is far greater than they are. And he keeps them, keeps them away. He keeps me safe. I am his child. I am his servant. But I must be honest and tell you that it has not been easy. Since they cannot kill me, they would like nothing better to make me fall and to become even worse than I was before. Even after his conversion to Christ, the demons would visit him and try their best to persuade him to return to them. At times, the temptation was great. 
but failing to make him fall, the demons would attack him physically. Now and then, Kadel would feel a push or a shove as he walked by the side of the road next to a ditch or an oncoming vehicle. But there would be no one nearby who could have touched him, no one human at least. And Kadel could often see things which were not visible to the physical eye. He could see the demons in their true forms, frequently grotesque and repulsive creatures that lurked in the shadows. He could see them. It was not easy or physically pleasant for Kadel to follow Jesus Christ. But he felt a great joy in sharing his testimony. And this village sorcerer, it seemed, was interested. Finally, the sorcerer asked Kadel, what do I need to do to follow Jesus Christ? Kadel said, you must turn away completely from your present masters and burn everything you have that belongs to them. You must believe in Jesus Christ as your only Lord and Savior and trust him in everything. All that stuff must be destroyed and burned. And the sorcerer replied, I think I would like to follow Jesus. Praise the Lord, beamed Kadel softly. Would you like to have your things burned today? There was a whole room full of occultic paraphernalia to burn. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's wait until tomorrow to burn the things. I would feel better if we wait until tomorrow. Kadel concealed his disappointment. Kado said, well, it would be better to do it right away, but uh, yeah, tomorrow would be all right. Then the sorcerer said, Kadel, you can have supper together with me and my family and spend the night here. And so after supper had been cleared away that night, a straw mat was laid on the wooden floor for Kadel. He stretched out on the hard surface and fell asleep until morning. The next morning, good morning, Kadel. Kado looked up from his Bible in the morning and saw the sorcerer standing in the doorway. The sorcerer said, my teachers visited me last night. You know, the spirits from Thailand that I told you about yesterday, they came to me in a dream. They told me that if I wanted to leave them and follow Jesus Christ, it's all right with them. <laughs> but they said that I shouldn't just burn up all of their things. They suggested that we hold a ceremony for them, offering animal sacrifices to return their things to them in a proper and dignified manner. In fact, they said that if their things were not given back to them in the right way, that I had better watch out. So what do you want to do? Kadel asked uneasily. Well, I think I'd like to do what they say. Yeah, I, I still want to believe in Jesus but I ought to leave them on their terms. If we hold the ceremony they are asking for, then they'll leave me alone. But Jesus will protect you, protested Godel. God created the whole universe through Jesus. He is far greater than your masters. They won't be able to hurt you as long as you cling to Jesus. We cannot come to Jesus on Satan's terms, no. We can only come to Jesus on his terms. And that means we unconditionally sever our relationship with Satan, breaking whatever promises we made to him. The sorcerer replied, ah, I, I don't think I can do that. I'm afraid of what they might do to me and my family. Maybe it's better if I don't believe in Jesus Christ. And after that, Karel walked the 10 miles back to Batuampar, disappointed. So much wasted time and effort, he said to himself with a sigh. Now, as mentioned earlier, we had had our old house demolished and rebuilt in 1982. And as you saw earlier, it had a big room for our Sunday services on the ground floor at the front. That's where you saw Karel leading worship. And upstairs, we had bedrooms for guests and our workers. Brother Akong was also staying with us, in addition to Git Chiang sitting next to him, that little boy. 
the little motherless boy we had informally adopted. Today, that little boy you see there, he oversees 85 churches in the state of West Kalimantan. Next week, I'll share more about what we saw in Indonesia. Thank you for joining us. Okay, 